Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a wonderful agenda planned, packed with viewings, and a wonderful discussion with our astute panel here from um, all around the world, uh, mostly Alaska. But um, I, know <laughs> I know you didn't come here to, to listen to me talk, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our first film and then um, yeah, go from there. What's the best fisherman? Is the best fisherman the one that makes the most money? Is the best fisherman the one that catches the most fish? Is the best fisherman the one that catches the biggest fish? To me, the best fisherman is the one that has the best fish. watershed is one of the most uh, healthy salmon watersheds in all of North America. Most watersheds can only handle one or two species of salmon. The Taku has all five species of salmon. What that means for our fishery is that we can provide commercially viable salmon sustainably harvested for five to six months out of the year. There's almost no other river system that you can do that. The inlet itself is stunning, absolutely stunning. I love the quote, the silence is deafening. We want people to taste the smell of Alaska, the fresh ocean air, the stillness, to be humbled by the quality of what, what is here. Taka River Reds does differently on the boats is everything to the fish. By proper handling, making sure that the fish are not bound by gravity, rapid chilling, getting the blood out is key, and we do that with a hypodermic needle, and we actually pump the blood out within moments of the fish coming on board. It's the blood that makes fish taste fishy. It's not the meat, it's just the blood. So we want to get the blood out before it coagulates, deep inside the capillaries. I want you to taste a sockeye. I want you to taste a coho. I want you to taste a king and know the difference. And you can tell that by removing the blood. We've always felt like our fish uh, is of the highest quality because we're doing everything we know of to preserve that quality. But uh, that's all subjective. To have a scientist use a machine that objectively tells us those numbers and says, yes, you're doing the right thing with this fish is, is really very cool. Everything else we do is for the health of salmon fisheries. Over the years, our habitat conservation efforts at Taku River Reds have become just as important as the fishing and the processing and the handling of the fish. Nobody here wants to catch the last fish. It's too scary to think of the other options, that what we have today might not be around in a very near future if we don't take care of it and protect it. There are no employees, it's just the six of us. We're a group of fishermen and fishing families. What it means to us is not just being able to eat the finest fish on the planet, but when you fish for your family, the goal isn't really to the pocketbook. It's about fishing for the future. You're just not making a living. We're, we're doing things that, that touch people in a certain way because they, they're getting a piece of Alaska. They're getting something that they know is the highest quality. They're supporting our way of life, our fishermen's way of life. There's a lot more beyond just going to the store and buying something to eat.
Thank you everybody for showing up today. Um, thank you especially to Aji and Vicky who have been working with me uh, for the last couple of months to put this together. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, again, my name is Jill and I'm here from Juneau, Alaska today on behalf of Sam and Beyond Borders, uh, which is a campaign that uh, is a collective group of, of different interests um, ranging from commercial and sport fishermen to tribes and First Nations to municipal leaders throughout the region, business owners, tour operators that are all working to raise awareness uh, for this resource that we're here today that brings us together today and in different components uh, kind of unites our, our work. Um, and that resource is wild salmon. And that resource is uh, currently threatened in Southeast Alaska by development upstream in British Columbia. So I think it's important to mention at the forefront of this presentation, and I, I do this in all my talks, but I wanna suggest that this is not an anti-mining campaign. In fact, on my flight down here, and I've certainly had quite a few interesting conversations in all of my travels from Juneau. You know, people say, where are you from? And it kind of goes on its own course. But when you tell them you're from Alaska and that you work for salmon conservation, they say, what are you against? This is common. And it just happened on my way down here, actually. This woman said, she's a planner from Seattle. She said, what are, what are you campaigning against? And we like to say that we're campaigning or advocating for salmon, but it's not just salmon, it's, it's a livelihood. It's something that allows fishermen and families and traditional lifestyles to maintain and continue. And what I get to do is work with all these different interest groups to ensure that that system and that cycle and that lifestyle can continue for the present and generations to come. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a quick background of, of the issue itself. Um, and, and we, as a campaign, the San Beyond Borders campaign, um, produced a, a six-minute film, which we'll show again before we break out into a panel discussion. But um, feel free. This is really informal. If you have a question along the way, please just raise your hand. Let me know. Otherwise, we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer afterwards. Um, so starting from kind of the beginning, rather, um, in 2014, there was a Northwest transmission line completed in British Columbia. Um, Northwest British Columbia is an area that has about 2,000 people. Um, so it's kind of the middle of nowhere, right? And so when this power line was completed, it created this chaotic craze, rather, to, to start development, to start any type of project that, that could be started. 73% um, of the world's mining companies are based in Vancouver. Um, so that's just one, one start of, of this flow and momentum. And then also the former Prime Minister of Canada, um, Harper, under his administration, all federal environmental regulations were deregulated. And this created kind of a free-for-all, more or less, for, for exploration of development. Um, and if you look at uh, different websites and different maps, um, I think that, are we, can we go to that map? Yeah. Um, there, it's, it's just a slew. There's a plethora of different projects ranging, different mining, types of mining all throughout the, the, the region. Um, but we, the Sam Beyond Borders campaign, is primarily focused on this northwest, south, northwest British Columbia, southeast Alaska region. And again, I'm from Juneau, which is on this side of the map. It's the capital of Alaska. We have about 30,000 people. And in Southeast Alaska, there's about 75,000 people total. On that side of uh, the other side of the border in British Columbia, there's 2,000. So again, it's, it's not heavily populated, um, heavy, heavily populated area. And the size itself is similar to that of the, the country of France. So that's it's this gigantic region. Not a lot of people, not a p lot of people know about it. Um, and there are these different mines that we're focusing on, again, 10, because of their size, scale, and scope, and their proximity to Alaska, that we are, we're highlighting and working to raise awareness for because we don't have any say. As downstream interests, those of us in Southeast Alaska, there are no established protections for us to protect and ensure long-term water quality and enforceable protections to our 
fisheries and the industries that keep Alaska going in southeast. Um, so again, just I'll give you a quick example. The KSM project, which is down here in the Eunuch watershed, uh, that project was approved by the provincial and federal government in Canada. It would be the largest open pit mine in North America and the fifth largest in the world. That's 19 miles upstream from Alaska um, and it runs into Misty Fjords National Monument which is a federally protected area obviously. And I'll mention also that all of Southeast Alaska, this area through here is under protection of the Tongass National Forest, which is the largest national forest in the United States. So on our side, the United States side of these rivers, you have the largest or the highest level of federal protections. And on the BC side, it's under development. Um, the current pr uh, premier of British Columbia, Christy Clark, wanted her legacy to be in this region 10 mines in 10 years, and she's exceeded that as far as what stages of development these mines are in. Um, so again, our main ask is that we're raising awareness to this issue, to this region that isn't populated, that we're giving a voice to the commercial fishermen, to the tribal governments, to the tour operators that rely on healthy fisheries and clean water to continue to draw tourists and fishermen in for sport fishing. Um, so we, over the years, have been trying to figure out what type of enforceable mechanisms different policies, international policies are out there and available to influence these standards that will guarantee protections for generations to come. And really that's our target, that's our ask, is that um, under the Boundary Waters Treaty, which was signed by both countries in 1909, uh, we have the authority to have a say as United States citizens and downstream stakeholders in Alaska to determine how these globally significant watersheds are developed. Um, so again, just trying to get that seat at the table. It's a complex, convoluted issue involving different international laws and different interests. Um, but it's been an incredible issue in that it has brought together all sectors of Southeast Alaska, ranging from the tribal governments to the business owners to our congressional delegation. Um, Alaska's congressional delegation, which are our, all ours, uh, very, very strong conservatives, um, have supported us through this effort in the sense that this is our way of life in Southeast Alaska and the majority of the state. Salmon is our way of life. In Southeast Alaska alone, there's a $2 billion industry. Commercial fishing, $1 billion annually. Tourism, $1 billion annually. These industries are dependent upon these clean waters and we, we maintain that we should have a say in how these shared watersheds are developed. So getting back to the fact that it is clunky and before I continue to ramble, we have explored different ways in which we can help tell our story. How do we raise awareness? How do we get someone in the middle of the United States or Bay Area of California to really care, be aware of this issue? And through that, um, we've had great contacts with filmmakers and brother-in-laws working for Google and okay. chefs uh, throughout the country. It's been extraordinary. Um, and last summer in particular, uh, a very good friend of mine in Juneau is, uh, is, is gaining momentum and attention as a chef. He last year was a James Beard nominee. Uh, he was also awarded um, the America's Greatest Seafood Chef uh, at a seafood cook-off cook in New Orleans. Um, so he's gained a lot of attention and is utilizing that attention to help raise awareness to the importance of sustainable fisheries throughout Alaska. Um, last summer we hosted this small sustainable seafood dinner in Juneau that was mostly local folks and it had a great return. It, had, it, it got media t attention that was syndicated all the way from San Francisco to Miami. Um, we had a chef from the Bay Area, Richie, who was supposed to be here today, unfortunately had to deal with some restaurant issues and unable to join us, but he was here last year. We had a chef from uh, Houston and a chef from Seattle, and that was great. And so Bo and I, Chef Bo and I, wanted to just make this bigger and better. And 
through the utilization of products like Kirk's Fish, he's continued to just have great attention and, and chefs throughout the country have been drawn to his work and what he's trying to accomplish. And so this summer, we just in July, uh, put together the first inaugural Southeast Feast, uh, which was uh, an event to raise awareness for the bounty of Southeast Alaska and the importance of, of sustainable fisheries. Um, that event brought up Chef Trevor and Tim, who are here with us today, and we'll, we'll get to hear from them a little bit later, but um, it was an incredible success. And we had 400 people show up to this event to just eat wild Alaskan seafood. Um, and so through that, through the film you're about to see, we've been able to attract a different attention and a different um, care or concern for this issue as it relates to how we connect with people, like what we're eating, right? Um, so with that, I think we'll go into our short film and then uh, we'll be here to answer any questions. So thank you. surroundings here really define how we live our lives, um, how we relate to each other. There's energy, there's a pulse, you know, it's almost like being in a big city or the stock market, you know, you're wheeling, you're dealing, you're, things are moving. These wild Alaskan salmon, or maybe they're wild Canadian salmon, you know, and they're feeding the world. Southeast Alaska's fishery is over a billion dollars. Tourism is over a billion dollars in industry. I, I can't think of much money that I've made in my life that wasn't because of fit. Four words, man. Humpies pay the bills. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, it, it doesn't get any bigger. This, this is it. It's like the farmer depends on rain for his crops, you know. It's, we depend on our environment for these fisheries that we're all involved in. Yes, that's British Columbia, and yes, this is Alaska, but as far as the fish and the nature and the essence of the river, there's no line there. But the bulk of these fish are coming back to these three big transboundary rivers, the Takustakin and the Eunuch. And if you see impacts to the fish in there, those impacts are going to cascade across southeast Alaska through the different economic sectors. No matter where you fish in southeast Alaska, you're probably at risk from some of the effects of these mines. All this mining proposed mines are taking place across the border in Canada, so we're not going to see any kind of economic benefit. The only thing we're going to see in this region is the environmental risks. I mean, when I became aware of the scale the mines proposed, Tailings dams up there are going to have to contain several billion tons of acid generating rock. Uh, that stuff has to be kept out of the waters forever. Forever is a hell of a long time. I haven't seen data that convinces me that we have that capability in, in those kind of rugged places. And I'm not even entirely convinced that that's their highest goal. There has been a lot of deregulation for environmental protection in Canada and in BC with the very transparent agenda of pushing through as many new mines through as possible. You know, when our people asked about the tailings and whether they were safe and the answer was always the same. It's the exact same structure as Mount Pauly. And it's safe, it's perfectly safe. It's perfectly safe. The area is really, really lush. Lots of clean water and lots of cedar trees and it's this really special place. And this happened right before 
the salmon were coming. Back and what, what kind of insurance coverage do you have? Um. Seen is believing, yep. But try it on a scale seven times bigger. Tribes, commercial and sport fishermen, subsistence fishermen, uh, a lot of the local governments. Right now, you've got almost all sectors of Southeast in agreement that these BC mines are a threat to our interest over here. There's not enough controls on them, and we want more engagement from the state of Alaska and the U.S. feds. What would you say to Secretary Kerry? I would say that, you know, he has a responsibility to protect probably the last pristine piece of the United States and do with everything he has. Um, I think we'll just introduce ourselves and then I think Aji has a couple questions that she can help get the ball rolling. But again, um, Jill Whites, I'm down here from Juneau, Alaska. Um, my background is in uh, environmental policy. Prior to working um, on the Sammy Beyond Borders campaign, uh, I was a compliance and enforcement officer for the state of Alaska and I traveled around the state inspecting mines. Um, and seafood processing plants actually um, before I decided that I, I wanted to be on the other side and, and help ensure that, that um, these companies are, are held accountable and, and their permits are, are enforced. And um, this journey has been quite fantastic, uh, just being able to work with, with different folks throughout the, the British Columbia and Alaskan region. Um, and I've learned a ton along the way, so yeah. cool. Uh, hi, Kirk Hardcastle. Um, I'm up and down from here uh, in that I'm an ore cowboy, born and raised here uh, up in Sonoma County, and I pretty much um, followed my palate in life. And it led me to finding the finest seafood in the entire planet that I could eat, and that led me up into Alaska and becoming a commercial fisherman. Uh, I've been working in the, if you grew up in Sonoma County, you either make wine or you work in the food industry, and I worked in the food industry, so I really just kept chasing food all my life, and it led me up to there to really uh, just trying to find the finest fish that I could. Coincidentally, uh, it came from anybody who knows where the Russian River is, and it's a big part is that just a couple generations before me, it was said that salmon were stacked like cordwood on the riverbanks before the industries had come in and decimated the habitat. How many salmon did I grow up with? I'm almost 50. How many salmon did I grow up with in my generation on the riverbanks? Zero. So to think that if the generations in the past had the wherewithal to engage themselves in the industry like you to show that you can vote with your fork by voting for salmon, even though it's a long distance away, but as a concept um, to understand that when you go to these guys' restaurants and you ask for wild fish, you're not only supporting uh, fishermen's way of life, once again, but also management practice and our environmental conservation and natural resource extraction industries that promote for sustainable and resilient practices that maintain mm -hmm. primary economic drivers within the region. 
being pulling away uh, wild salmon fisheries in Alaska, uh, since fisheries are a primary economic driver, it would be like pulling Google out of here. It's a big deal. Up there, that's who we are and what we are. And how do you maintain these primary economics within that region that are important to the people that live there? And uh, we want to be able to maintain uh, our way of life. I want to know that generations from now that salmon will be on the riverbanks. If the generations before me, my great-great-grandparents, ever knew or thought that I would not grow up with salmon on the banks, I think they would, would have thought twice about what they did. Um, and it led me to go up to Alaska because I turned it, I wanted to eat some salmon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I became a commercial fisherman up there. I now have a company and I move fish across the entire United States. And as you saw in our video, uh, I'm not about abundance. I'm not about quantity. I'm about quality, the quality of life, the feeling, the passion that the fish can bring to you. Um, and I hope you get to taste it, especially in the sushi here today. Um, so thank you for being here. I'm honored that you even think of seafood and salmon. And these chefs make it <clears throat> possible to bring it as a vehicle to you. Um, and it's, it's ever essential. We do what we do in Alaska, and you consume what you consume down here, but having the chefs involved is, is paramount in their awareness of what they're doing and how they're moving it to you to make sure that you have the best experience so that you get to taste the feeling, the air, the passion of Alaska. So thanks to the chefs primarily, because they you. make it so we can eat. <laughs> awesome. Uh, my name's Trevor Kunk. Um, uh, most recently, I was cooking in the Napa Valley, um, but I am actually departing this week to go back to the East Coast, back to Brooklyn, New York. Um, not nearly as old as Kurt, um, <laughs> but I have, uh, well, maybe. Um, I, I have, I mean, I've been chasing perfect food as well um, ever since, I mean, I discovered it when I was seven, eight, nine years old. I was always in the kitchen, um, but I'm from Florida originally. And as a child growing up in Florida, you would go to a restaurant and they would call it Florida seafood. And it was the scallops. It was a shrimp, but scallops don't really come from Florida. And the oysters that they were serving were much larger than you would actually get there. So. Um, over the years, I've had kind of different revelations in regards to seafood, and it's something that I'm obsessed with, just like everybody that's mm -hmm. sitting here right now and the chefs that were up in Alaska with us. Um, and it goes kind of back to being a chef, being a consumer, and being a father. Like, I want to know where my food's coming from, because I'm going to be serving that to my family. I'm going to be serving that to the guests. I'm going to be serving it to the, the friends. And being able to go to Alaska and connect with somebody like Kirk and see where that fish is coming from was amazing. And that's really what I was looking for on that trip. Um, and I'm just very thankful that got to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Appreciate it. Yeah. So. Hi, I'm Tim Archuleta. I'm the owner and executive chef of Ichi Sushi in San Francisco. Um, I've been making sushi for 21 years, and it's not on the forefront of our website or on our menu at EG, but we consider ourselves a sustainable restaurant. Um, I don't like, you know, there was a big fad there for a while, a lot of restaurants opened up sustainable restaurants, carrying a limited amount of fish because these were sustainable fish. Um, we don't put that in the front. I want you to taste the food before I want you to taste a gimmick. Um, but the sustainability is very important to me, not only because of what I'm going to leave for the next generation, <clears throat> but also it's job security. I'm a sushi chef. That's what I do. If I don't have fish, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Veggie sushi is only so delicious. <laughs> so it really is. I, I think about it all the time. I think about, about what is happening and what we see in the industry for being there for 21 years. You see eel, freshwater eel. Well, first of all, it's a weird thing. They don't serve freshwater eel in Japanese restaurants or in Japanese sushi bars in Japan. You go to an anagi place that serves it, they grill it, they put it on rice bowl, and that's how you eat it. You would never eat it in a sushi restaurant. Here in America, we love it because it's one of the five things you can get pretty much at every sushi restaurant <laughs> in America. Salmon, tuna, hamachi, eel, yeah. shrimp, right? Every restaurant has that. You come to ours, you're going to see things you've never seen in your entire life. You'll see some of those things also, but with how they're caught, and I know this is going to be a little taboo, we do carry some farm-raised fish, but it's raised in a way that I feel is sustainable and that you're using practices that we agree with. Um, sustainability, like, like this thing of sustainability is interesting because you think about it of like, okay, like, 
how is it being caught? How is it, is it, you know, I know you probably get this also being sustainable, but it's coming from Alaska, it's so far away. You know, there's, there's, we get most of our fish from Japan, and there's planes coming every day from Japan that they have a special little holder that hold our fish that come in from there. So the plane, it's not like a special, a special flight coming down. It's the same thing with the, with the mm -hmm. way that the, yeah. the salmon, salmon is being shipped down here. This is all coming on commercial air, airplanes. So, you know, it, you, can, you can do a lot of research on sustainability, and you can do as much homework as you, as you, as you can and still not really know if something is 100% sustainable. So for us, we try to learn as much as we can. We go with that. But with issues like polluting the water and stuff like this, going up to Alaska, being able to, we went out, they took us out for a day on the boats, and we got to see the different types of fishing that they did up there. And it was incredible to actually see the people who are, I mean, this is their livelihood. And the whole town of Juneau pretty much <laughs> <laughs> like, a lot of salmon crazy, you know? I mean, yes. Trevor got a salmon tattoo. Yeah. Actually, who, three of those chefs got salmon tattoos. Right, right. well, that's what Vivian did the year before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, like, this is like how ingrained it is. Like, there's, there is an actual uh, tribal picture for a salmon up there. That's, it's, it's part of their lives. It's, it's kind of like how I go with the same sustainability. I said, it's part of my life. It's important to me. It's how I make a living. It's how I pay the bills. So going up there and be able to see the process, to be able to talk to the people, to see how it's, how it's processed. You know, we get all of our salmon roe comes from Alaska. And to be able to go to the actual processing plant mm -hmm. and see how it's actually done and see it there before it comes to my restaurant was, was incredible. And, you know, Kirk said something about voting with your fork. I think that's something that's very, very, very important. Voting with your fork is, is, you know, if you are trying to, you love salmon and you're not quite sure if it's from uh, a farm from somewhere that's not using sustainable practices, don't buy it. If you're not sure, if they can't, if your fisherman can't tell you or the guy at the meat counter can't tell you where it's from or not quite sure, it's better not to get it, to be honest with you, because mm -hmm. it's affecting it's affecting it greatly. Again, 21 years, eel you, you, eel you used to be able to get in abundance. Now it's really hard to get. Why? Because they're fishing it unsustainably. Bluefin tuna. We don't carry bluefin tuna at the restaurant. People lose their minds. They get so mad at me. Like, <laughs> Why don't you have toro? And I said because it comes from bluefin tuna. Oh, but the stocks are back up. Yeah, that's what you. You can research that and look on the internet, but are you sure they're really back up? I mean, Japan has warehouses beyond warehouses beyond warehouses full of frozen tuna, because they know at some point it's not gonna be around. And they're gonna have, they have stockpiles of it, because they know it's gonna be worth a lot of money, because people want it. We don't carry it. It's not sustainable. I don't wanna decimate a fish off the planet, because I wanna serve because it tastes delicious. Voting with your fork, I think, is one of the coolest things that I've heard at this, this panel. And I think it's something that we need to take very seriously. I can, I'd like to add on to that really quick in regards to Alaska is that um, the way we manage our fisheries is a sustainable management system. And yes, they do have to get flown. And so that's, the con that's where you kind of go through the compromise of flying. You realize, wow, the, there's a big carbon footprint. Is this? like truly on the whole gambit of the word of sustainability. It's a really greenwashed word these days. Unless you really get in the specifics of what you're looking at, you can pick and pull uh, the definition of sustainability out in a lot of funny ways. But what we mean by voting with your fork is saying, when you, when you say, I want to eat that, and voting with your fork, I'm putting money towards this economic resource that's a management system that is making sure that there will be that fish not for you, not for your kids, for the great-great-grandparents, great-great-grandkids. And that's the main goal, yeah. is to make sure that those fish can still be in the river systems on your plate. And when you vote with your fork, you're saying, I approve of this system that'll be, hopefully be around much longer than I will be. 
Um, and so uh, just ask for you know, the most sustainable, most wild, uh, as far as a management system or harvesting practices that you can possibly find. That was a question that came up in our other panel. How do we, how do we know? What do we, how do we know what we're buying? If you basically just really focus on sustainability of the harvest as well as if you can ask for a while as much as you can, but it does come to the depleted stocks as well. Um, as a gross generalization, wild from Alaska, you're doing pretty darn well. Because it's, <laughs> uh, it's an Article 8 of the Alaska Constitution. It's part of who we are, like the American Constitution of Freedom of Speech and many other these rights that are just core to the being of the United States, that's very unique in the world. Core to the being of Alaska is in Article 8 of the Alaska Constitution, and that is to maintain sustainable fisheries forever. So that's key for us as well. So thank you. Yeah. It's really hurting me more than you can imagine what I saw with the mining and, and um, the accidents and all. British Columbia is home for us. Mm -hmm. um, we became a family there. and. Um, all these things are very important when we live there as well, and mm -hmm. they remain important. Um, but before we get this into Canada bashing, I just would like to point it out that um, two things, um, that I'm sure that in the States there are a lot of things, bad things like this happen as well elsewhere. Um, and the other thing is that um, I know for a fact that there are a lot of people in Canada who feel the same way. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And um, a lot of people who fight really hard, like the Debbie Suzuki Foundation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure you are in contact a with them. Absolutely. Um, huge respect to them. I used to work for them on their website. And um, But it's really, really, really important what you are doing, and I fully support it. And you know, voting with a fork, we've been doing it um, for the last 15 years, probably. Yeah. Um, super important, and um, raising awareness as well. Yeah. So thank you for what you do. Thank, thank you. you. And Absolutely. that's key. A, a lot of people that were the native groups that were, um, and people in the video are from Canada. That's yeah. a big proponent on that side. Yeah. Is very, very important to us as well. And um, hey, you know, I got to tell you, I love mining. Are you kidding? I have this. I drive a car. I drive a boat. And my boat is a diesel engine. And it operates with metals and copper. And I use all the things from mining. <coughs> um, I love mining. Irresponsible mining is a very different story. And it's kind of like driving down the highway. Everybody abides by the rules of 50 to 55. And anyone driving a semi truck at 120 miles an hour, that's not abiding by the general common sense rules of safety and awareness for a lot of other people. And there are a lot of Canadians who support that as well. Um, it's mostly just uh, making sure that everybody abides by the social contract that we all have with each other and our emotional contract that we have with the salmon as well to live in, in unison and the giving and the receiving of what salmon do for the people is, is really important. <laughs> yes, and just and just to say that the Harper government has done so much damage, mm -hmm. and I'm really, really, I wanting it ending it on a very positive note that um, Mr. Trudeau, like our Trudeau. New, new prime minister, woo, you know, like <laughs> I'm so, so hopeful, and I really want it to to be a very positive thing, yeah. and I'm and I'm really totally hoping agree. that he's gonna pull off what he needs to pull off after yeah. all that Harper did. Yeah. Absolutely, we've um, we've been fortunate enough to work with an incredible group of folks from British Columbia, but mm -hmm. also with lawmakers in Ottawa. Right. We've had great meetings uh, that have, you know, folks that are filled with that same hope, um, mm -hmm. especially for, for this, the region that we're, we're speaking to. Um, it, last fall, uh, President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau signed the Strategic Leadership Agreement uh, for the Arctic region, um, which incorporated, you know, uh, the awareness and, uh, for indigenous rights and, and putting that at the forefront of, of decision making, especially as it re relates to environmental issues um, around climate and development. So there, there are huge steps taking mm -hmm. place uh, just just post Harper, which, which are incredible. We have a long way to go, but okay. we know that um, we're not going to get anywhere without the support from British Columbia and Canada. So we absolutely don't intend to bash. We only intend to raise awareness for the fact that Business can't continue as usual. We're not under any illusion that we're going to stop mining, mm -hmm. um, but but how can we ensure that best available technologies and practices are implemented and adhered to? Fully agree. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more to the relationship that you guys have? And I don't know if it's specifically your campaign, um, but the like on a government, the the government side of things like. Um, 
how is that relationship with British Columbia and and like with the future of these mines? Mm -hmm. um, do you see them all moving forward or is there some slowdown because of Trudeau and because you have, there is this increased awareness? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's my sister, by the way. Um, so it, it's a, it's, it is a good question. And I think that has been um, the biggest changing, the big, biggest dynamic feature of our campaign efforts is focusing primarily with um, the state of Alaska and the province of BC. And some of you may know or may not know that um, authority lies within the province in Canada. Um, the federal government has authority over their fisheries, but all natural resource development and management is managed at the provincial level. So um, there's been a headway in the sense that the state of Alaska is working really close with the province of British Columbia to kind of improve transparency and correspondence and um, provide opportunity for involvement um, and well, for the state of Alaska to be involved in, in the permitting process. But again, you know, Canada is, they only have to listen uh, if they want to, rather. Um, but at the same time, while, while this is happening, we have different agreements happening at the federal level and different regulatory agencies saying like, well, we could do this or we could do that. And again, people are talking about it. Um, we have to remind ourselves not to be discouraged because this is part of a conversation that wasn't two years ago. Um, so people are talking about it. And as we know in bureaucratic systems, it takes a while to get things going. But on the other side to that, uh, while we're having these conversations, British Columbia is continuing to permit and develop these projects. Um, for example, you guys saw in that film the Mount Polly mine disaster that happened in south central British Columbia into the Fraser River watershed. Um, that same mine proprietor, Imperial Metals, um, was authorized three days after an uh, expert panel review had suggested that business can't go on as usual. You can't have wet tailings. You have to do this. You have to do that. Um, and the BC government said, OK, we're going to stop. We're going to try to improve our practices and enforcement. But under the table, three days later, authorized Imperial Metals to open a much bigger mine in the headwaters of a transboundary river, the Stikine River. Um, and so it's practices such as that that make us weary of, while we're doing all these things and making headways in certain areas, they're still pushing straight ahead. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's continuing to raise awareness. It's continuing to target elected leaders, to write your elected leaders and suggest that, you know, it's, it's not just about salmon. It's if, if we're going to do this, if we're going to continue to develop and extract natural resources, we're, it, we're in the 21st century. We have to do it right. We have to m in, ensure that that, that is, is going into consideration. An add on to that one is that, um when that dam collapsed and broke free, uh, that same structural engineer company style of making dams is what my thing is, is that, okay, hey, we know this, we don't drive Pintos anymore, people, you know? Let's stop putting gas tanks in the back of cars because rear ends can explode a car with a family in it. Those same types of engineering disasters aren't being mitigated and changed for the next stage of mining production and development. Like I said, I'm all for the mines, but why build a mining dam that we know that style breaks free and they're permitting to proceed with that same style in multiple different mines across North America? Um, why not build a mine that you, uh, I mean, a dam that you know is like the Hoover Dam? Well, it's going to hold for a long time. You know, and just mitigate that type of things. Like Google, you don't put out a product that fails in a couple of months and grossly, like it makes big time head headlines, right? You want to put out something that can maintain its a resiliency in the marketplace or structural engineering or electrical engineering that can last for a long, long, long time, not just something that you really know is going to break. And oh, it broke last week. So let's fix it and try and improve upon it. So that's one of the main parts with these dams that they're bait is that they want to build the same style of dam and just say, hey, let's make a better integrated network matrix built in the superstructure of the dam itself. Um, is there a model for success that are, um, you know, any 
sort of measure or negotiation that you're really optimistic about that you can kind of see as being like a, a real solution? Yeah, like what does winning look like to us? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> That's My boss asks me that all the time. Um, I think that um, first and foremost, um, like Kirk was just mentioning, you know, this wet tailings design that they've been operating um, and approving throughout British Columbia, we know that it won't last. I mean, some of these pictures might suggest, but for any of you that have been to Southeast Alaska or British Columbia, it's rugged, steep mountains, and it's wet. It's a temperate rainforest. You're adding, you're, you're just setting yourself self up for failure in that regard. So as far as like engineering and structure of the mining goes, you know, it's been recommended that they do dry stack tailings, which is a different type of tailing storage, which is seemingly it's still, um, it's, it's more contained and you don't have this big man-made earthen dam that is set to, to fail and, and flood and break. And um, so that's one component of it. But again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're just, we're, we want to have a part in, in determining what the development um, looks like moving forward and how uh, these environmental regulations are strengthened again and how indigenous rights and how uh, indigenous governments take, take a huge part and, and contribute a huge part to that process. Um, and so I think it's, it's kind of all encompassing as far as what it looks like. It's, it's ensuring that this region that is rich in natural resources, including salmon, including minerals, is is developed in a sustain, as sustainable of a way as we can do. So um, without getting too specific, that's kind of just the broad landscape. Um, you know, there have been a bunch of reports that have come out, especially in the last six months, from, the, from British Columbia's own Auditor General, suggesting that British Columbia is failing on all accounts to enforce uh, um, their permits and, and protect their environment. You know, their own auditor general is suggesting that. There have been economists that have done financial assurance reports that, have, that are suggesting taxpayers are um, liable. $1.5 million in debt as far as um, taxpayers' accountability to pay off fines for mining companies. And, that, and that's just in this region, just this region of British Columbia, not the entire province as a whole. So it's things like that where building awareness to that and ensuring that these practices are going to continue, or, or this, this, this industry is going to continue, but let's make sure that these best practices are actually adhered to. Yep. Um, for Taku River Reds, is mining one of the biggest issues you see going forward, or could you speak to other problems you might have, like climate change and warmer waters? Or Oh, um, you ask awesome questions. <laughs> Can I be here for a couple hours? <laughs> um, I would say for Taku River Reds, um, my greatest uh, issue, I would say our greatest hurdle that's coming up is hoping that all of you vote with your fork. <laughs> to me, it's about marginalization of an industry. I would like to see all of you vote with your fork rather than sitting back and going, oh, what are the governments doing here? What are the conservation groups doing here? You are more powerful than any government out there. You are more powerful than any conservation group out there. You saying, I support salmon. I support wild seafood, I support sustainability, is the most powerful thing anyone can ever do, and that is by voting with your fork in those directions. My example that I used up in the wine country last night is, uh, so I grew up in Sonoma County. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sonoma County built San Francisco. The natural resources that were there, it was the redwoods, the timber industry, you could drop one tree and you could build an entire neighborhood with one tree. So the timber industry and the pebble mines there, the gravel there built the streets of San Francisco, the uh, trees built the buildings of San Francisco, and the cobblestone streets, the cobblestones came from my backyards. So those places were zoned for natural resource extraction at the cost of salmon habitat. What happened was the marginalization of those industries, those kind of deregulated industries, the, those industries became marginalized because another industry came in and said, it's more important to us to have this new industry. Guess what that is? Wine. You voted with your cork. You voted with your fork. You chose something else out there that you think, as a people, not waiting for the government to decide, not for tree huggers to say, let's quit cutting down the redwoods, but you as a people decided that we want to support another style of industry that's in the exact same place. I grew up in a timber town and families. 
I mean, my friends' families were all part of the timber, and they were had the skill set of industrial, zoned industrial, truck drivers, and all of a sudden someone says, well, you can cut down a tree and get 20 bucks an hour, or you can work for the wine industry for 60 bucks an hour, because people were willing to vote with their fork, vote with their cork. You can marginalize an industry by you as individuals out there on what you buy and what you support and the emotions and passions that you bring to it by going to restaurants like this and making those requests. So that's what I see as our greatest hurdle is trying to get the public to, to empower the public um, with the seafood uh, consumption. Um, uh, let's see, as in regards to the mines, um, uh, I, I'm, I try to think positive in other ways. Um, but yes, mines are definitely with, without a doubt. There's, there's an issue in some of those regards. Um, the Taku is, you probably saw in the video, it is one of the largest, most healthy, diverse uh, watershed ecosystems in all of North America um, because of the genetic structures that are built within the salmon and other species habitats in there. I understand the voting with your fork part, and uh -huh. I think that's super important, yep. but I have friends who are fishermen in Alaska, and mm -hmm. a lot of them haven't been catching as much as usual, yep. and so it doesn't matter if we vote for our fork if there aren't any more salmon. Right. There will always be salmon in the future. Mm -hmm. They will shut our fisheries down before they extirpate the species itself. That's unique in Alaska. They do not manage their fisheries for my pocketbook or for your restaurants. They manage the fisheries in Alaska under Article 8. We manage the fisheries for the future. We fish for the future. You will never, in theory, unless something dramatically happens weird, but you can't extirpate and exhaust the, the resource there through the management system. So under climate change, if the fish do decline, they shut down our fishing days. So in the Taku system, I only fish Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, sometimes Wednesdays. If you're a smart fish and you're a taku salmon, you only swim up there on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. <laughs> um, also, they manage our gear for when we do put our gear in the water. They manage our gear to not catch fish. So we, they give us gear that, so some king salmon typically swim 40 feet and under. So guess how shallow our gear is? 30 feet. Our gear is also designed so that king salmon will bounce off the net uh, pardon me, it's not designed, it's managed to allow these fish to hit it and bounce off and swim. If there's a specific run of fish, they will manage it so they can actually swim through our gear. So we're targeting a specific person. Like for instance, if I were to do this, I would say I'm going to set my gear out to only catch people in pink dresses. Okay, or guys with beards. It's that targeted. Our bycatch in an entire year, an entire season, is maybe one bird. One bird. That's how targeted the way we fish. So fishermen, by nature, you have some friends. I'm not your typical fisherman. Fisherman, I'm supposed to complain a lot. You know, I'm supposed to be like, damn this and damn that. I'm, I try to see the more positive side of how fortunate I am to be able to have um, an abundance of seafood to be able to harvest and share with other people. Um, so the management system will keep it so that we still do have fish there. Climate change is a big issue for sure. The biggest difference that I've seen on that with climate change has been the meat quality and the fluctuations of meat quality and the changes in the styles of runs but the abundance of species that have the ability to reproduce and stay within the carrying capacity of our harvestable um, allotment, I think we're doing really well in that. Um, climate change is changing our, our uh, changing, I would say, the meat quality more than anything else, That would, as far as a big thing. So climate change is an issue, but not too much. Hmm. Following up on that, do we need to change, do we need to like reframe this conversation as, a need for like regenerative practices versus sustainable practices, or are Resilient we not practices. there yet? So uh, one of the key things is that um, you need to have a sustainable management uh, bureaucratic system to allow for resilient business practices to exist. Resiliency in business or management, any kind of management system, resiliency can't happen at the, at the large level bureaucratic system because um, those types of systems can't move and more fast enough from climate change, economic change, volatility, and in, in distribution of natural resources. So you have to have the stability in a bureaucratic system of sustainable management to allow for private businesses to work resiliency. So we are, as we were mentioning about sustainability, there's market-driven sustainability and institutionalized sustainability. Alaska is not market-driven sustainability, as Tim was saying. We are not market-driven sustainability in Alaska. We are institutionalized sustainability. It's not a greenwash stamp to put on there for, the, for selling a product. Um, so the sustainable layer of our uh, bureaucratic system and institutionalized system allows for resilient business practices to happen and move in more for the fluctuations of the marketplace. 
So I agree with what you had to say, but that's, that's one of the unique parts of what Alaska has over the rest of the world. Hi, I'm going to go back to the mining. Um, my question is, have, have the innovations been developed, the engineering, technology, whatever, been developed for what you would trust in a mining operation? Or are we still trying to invent that? Absolutely. Um, I think that there are, I mean, it's, that's kind of a hard question to answer in the sense that there are so many different scales of mines, right? Um, and we're talking about large scale open pit mines. We're not talking about um, smaller scale mines like we have throughout Southeast Alaska that have dry, sta <coughs> dry stack tailings, um, have different um, mining life in the sense that you know some are 15 to 20 years some are 30 to 40 years where these large-scale mines are failing at 14 to 17 years you know and, and set for for longer life lifespans um, I think that there are there there is the technology out there and it, it comes down to the government requiring that these companies implement that and um, and, and it's, it's an economic choice. It's these mining companies deciding whether or not they want to put forth the money to uh, ensure that health and safety come first prior to economic profit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can say confidently that, um, that those technologies do exist. And, and that's what we're, we're advocating for, that they are implemented. And at this point, it's, it's kind of up to the mining company whether or not they want to follow through with that. Yep. <laughs> Not to the scale of, of these mines. Yeah. But we have some small scale, very small scale mines that are very successful within uh, salmon habitat that do a fantastic job. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. What does winning look like? We have plenty of winning mines for sure in Alaska yep. that do very well. Yep. And the, the fact that these mines have to be large scale is the fact that the ore quality in these regions, it's really low grade ore. So they have to extract a ton of the earth in order to get profit. So that's what makes it a lot messier than, than practices that we have throughout Alaska, for example, that are done on a smaller operation scale. Yeah, so she was asking if, it, you know, is it dependent upon the, the scale of those mines? Is it, is it messier or more? Uh, is it harder to, to implement those better practices because of the scale as opposed to the smaller operations that have smaller operations and thus it's, it's more affordable for them to implement best technologies? Is that kind of what you were asking? Or did I answer it kind of within another question? Well, I'm just wondering if they don't do it because they can't or because they wouldn't be making as much money. Yeah, they, they wouldn't be doing it because they wouldn't be making as much money. Absolutely right. They absolutely can afford it. You know, these smaller, these like junior companies um, are, are adhering to, to these uh, better available technologies than these larger operations that want to extract as much as they can, pull as much as they can, and get out of there. So as a chef, how do you, because you're kind of working with the end consumer, right? Like ourselves, going to the restaurants, enjoying food. I think you allude to a little bit like people going to restaurants looking for sustainable restaurant, but that mes message may not necessarily be what true sustainability means. So how is the chef community is working with someone like Jill, like the fisherman, Kirk, like how do you guys do that within your community? And also how do you translate or educate and share that knowledge with your consumer that comes to your restaurants, et cetera? Um, so I, oh, can I talk first? Please. That? So I think what you just said was very important. You said educate because we never want to tell a guest how to eat. We're never going to tell them to do X, Y, and Z. Um, but what we can do is we can educate and we can train our staff, uh, inform them, and have them then relay that information to the guest. Um, sometimes it's really, really easy. Sometimes it's very, very difficult. And um, it really also depends uh, where you are. I mean, whether you're in the Napa Valley, whether you're in San Francisco, whether you're in New York, New Orleans, um, it takes time. Um, and what's something that I've been kind of thinking about even before I went to Alaska is, and this kind of goes back to my childhood, uh, don't get mad at me when I say this, but <laughs> I don't like salmon. 
Okay. I don't like salmon. Don't like but listen, yeah. so the reason I don't like it is is because I for me I've been eating the wrong thing for the past 20, 25, 30 years. And it's farmed raised garbage. All right. Um, and over the years, and when I say over the years, starting about eight, nine, ten years ago, and this happened to be where I was working in New York City, that's when we started, we, we didn't carry salmon unless it was Wild King salmon. We didn't, and if Wild King salmon wasn't available, then we would bring in sockeye or coho. But that salmon is a lot different than the farm salmon that we're all used to eating. Um, so I love salmon if it's wild. If it's the other notion that people have of what salmon is, which is super fatty, super thick, uh, just kind of odd in color, um, I don't like that stuff. So, um, it, it, but going back to the educational part, like if you have a guest that's coming in and they've been coming in for five years or 10 years and they've been ordering that same kind of salmon, it's really hard to wean them away. Um, so you just have to kind of take it slowly. And that's when, again, you have a very well-informed staff being able to share with the guests, like, well, why don't you have salmon like you did six months ago? And the reason is, is, well, we're sourcing locally, we're sourcing uh, seasonally. We don't want to buy it from South America. We don't want to buy it from New Zealand. We want to support the Alaskan fishery. And right now, what is available and five or six months out of the year is going to be sockeye or coho or on occasion uh, king. So. Um, I don't know if you get anybody have been to my restaurant. Um, I have woo mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it out the there. exact opposite of what Trevor said. We do tell people how to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole mural actually in the restaurant dedicated to how to eat sushi properly. Um, yes, I am a control freak. A, but B also it's to help you enjoy the product the best way. Um, you know, for us at, at our restaurant, if you mix a bunch of wasabi and soy sauce and completely, you know, the don't drown your food, PCAs or the, or the commercials used to have, you're not going to taste the, the hard work that this guy does mm -hmm. when he, when he fishes and, and, and does everything he does to keep the salmon as, as awesome as possible. Um, so for us, <laughs> we do educate you, rather, regardless if you want to or not. <laughs> You're gonna get educated. There's, there's, you know, I fight with customers. I've thrown customers out of the restaurant for arguing with soy sauce and wasabi. It, it, it there's, a, there's a proper amount. Um, but again, it's all about education. It's all about, you know, this. And something I wanted to mention earlier. This kind of goes with it too. It, in educating, seafood shouldn't be cheap. You know, we have this thing where like we want to be able to provide. Everybody should have access to everything, right? Which is a lot of the stuff that it's true. We should have access to certain things. But seafood is one of those things where I don't know if it should be accessible to everybody, and especially at a low price. It should be more expensive, because the more expensive it is, then we're not actually consuming as much. We're thinking twice about what we're actually eating. If we all of a sudden stop eating chicken and everyone goes to a seafood diet, it's going to be really hard to be able to sustain that, to be able to keep up with that. And you have a lot of, we're, we're on the more expensive side where I think we're a great value for what we do. We carry very high-end product. People complain how expensive we are all the time. And for me, it's educating them. Yeah, that's true because I'm paying top dollar for my seafood. Mm -hmm. I'm paying a lot of money. If you actually knew how much per pound my fish cost me, it would blow your mind. It shouldn't be something that everybody should have access to. It shouldn't be out there for $1.99. You shouldn't be eating sushi that costs you know, $2 a roll because we're wiping it off the planet with that kind of mentality. It should be more expensive. The, this guy should get more per pound for his Thank you. Salmon that he sells. <laughs> because because this it's a, it's as you can see, the abundance is not there what it used to be. In salmon and mm -hmm. California here we had three or four years where the salmon salmon commercial salmon uh, a lot of the time was like a month or two because we are decimating these fish mm -hmm. out of the water. Mm -hmm. We need to raise our prices. We need to be really thinking about what we're what we're doing to, to the oceans because it's it's a, it's a great resource, but 
there's, there's not that much fish out there for the whole world. I mean, it's also this weird thing too now, like you go to, my wife's from Flint, Michigan. When you go to Flint, Michigan, there's four sushi restaurants in Flint, Flint Michigan. Not that the, frit, the fish isn't fresh, but this all of a sudden, it's everywhere. And the amount of- In Flint. In yeah, Flint. it was like, of all places. <laughs> you know, so we need to think about like what we're actually, what we're paying for it. I think that's something that we did not talk about mm -hmm. here. It, again, it should be something that's much more expensive than it is. Okay, I have been Googling your restaurant as you've been talking, and I cannot get a reservation. So what is the key to getting a reservation <laughs> at your restaurant? <laughs> Oh, wow. You gotta go in there. I had to go in there. <laughs> Under the bus. <laughs> yeah. um, walk in. Okay. So you, might have to wait. you might have to wait oh, like yeah. a little bit, but we serve everything in the whole entire restaurant. And, and they yell at you when you walk in. It's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's a positive yell. Yeah, not, it's not, like not, not, not a yeah. <laughs> um, I Food is my life. That's what I do. And primarily seafood. And I'm kind of picky. That's why I have some of the finest seafood in the planet, specifically on the salmon side. And I was thoroughly impressed and didn't even flinch at the dollar signs. That was the greatest thing that we sat down, and I hope he enjoyed it as well, is, well, what would you like? And we all looked and said, chef's choice. If you go in, please, all of you go in sometime in your life and request chef's choice mm -hmm. and just don't even think about what you're, it's, it will be a life-changing experience in regards to sushi and how you approach seafood. It will change your palate. It'll change your dreams. Chefs are social media addicts, I think, or people are addicted <laughs> to following their lives. Mm -hmm. um, Taku River Reds, they have a great website, uh, sambeyondborders.org, our website. Um, there's a ton of information on there, ways in which you can take action, donate our films on there, share the film, et cetera. Just um, feel free to, to scope us out further, and we'll be around here for a while if you guys have questions later on. Thank you. Um, for me, I uh, vote with your fork. Vote with your cork. You know, uh, And it doesn't just go with your food. Whatever you do in life, if you support that style of management system, that business, or whatever it is, um, Vote with your dollar. It, it really means a lot. Um, government regular. I'm a fisherman, so I'm like, ah, oh, government regulation. Hey, in Alaska, there's barely a single fisherman that doesn't love heavy regulations. Because if we extirpated and wasted our resource in five years, I don't know about you guys, my mortgage is 30. And if I ran out of money in five, I can't pay my mortgage on anything. So to know that that resource is out there long enough to pay my mortgage and pay my other bills, is because people like you vote with your fork. You say, I want to support the management system for sustainable management systems as a governmental institutionalized policy, not as a market driven, which is market driven sustainability is great, but the way you can set your government up in regulations and say, we approve of this style. Um, you think of the Alaskan fishermen hating government, hating regulations. You know what? We don't hate that. We love it because it means we can have it for our great, great, great grandchildren and we can pay our bills as well. And it's fantastic to the palate and it tastes great. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for having us. <laughs> That's it for me. Yeah. Don't eat cheap sushi. Yeah. <laughs> not eat stuff? No. No? <laughs> no yeah. buffets, please. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's, uh, a, is there still more? Yeah, yeah I can cut up some more. So, so. so this is my fish that I brought here. It's all the pressure bled sockeye. Um, it's not going to be that bright, uh, fatty stuff. Uh, you're going to let the fish speak for itself. Please try it out. It will not taste what you expect it to taste like. It's going to taste like when your feet are in the ocean beach out here, your toes are in the sand, and the waves are hitting that fresh ocean air that passes through your palate. That's what we want you to taste. So please, you'll probably never, well, hopefully you guys will have this as a regular menu item, but right now it's, it's there. Please try it out. Yeah.